I just don't know how I'm supposed to score any appeal. Are you getting pummeled by pandas and ocelots? Uh, I don't think there's an ocelot card. Tired of being an Ark Nova weenie who can't even make your score icons cross? I mean, I'm, st I'm still having fun. Well, then come with me, because this is the time-tested, legally patented, Yuka training program for Ark Nova. <laughs> Welcome. I am two-time World Series of Board Gaming ring winner, two-time World Board Gaming Championships console winner, gaming legend and YouTube superstar Nick Cannon. Before I came along, 2023 ring winner of Brass Yuka had only played one game of Ark Nova. And after my training program, Yuka defeated three men on his way to World Series of Board Gaming Glory. Yuka, 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 Yuka. That is actually a true story. Uh, Yuka is an incredible gamer, and with just a little bit of knowledge and training equipped under his belt, he took on three people who knew exactly what they were doing in a competitive board gaming event. Hi, welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I am your host, Nick Henning. Greetings from Finland. My name is Yuka, and I 100% approve this program. After all, it got me to the grand finals. So come with me, become the Ark Nova Pro that you've always wanted to be. If it's your first time on the channel, consider giving a like and subscribe. The rest of this channel is all about strategy and board game strategy and how we can approach different games and think about uh, playing games with other people and sometimes deep dives into certain games, sometimes more kind of general. And uh, most of the videos are a more chill vibe than this one. First things first, you've got about 30 turns, maybe five breaks to jam as much appeal and conservation as you can get. Lesson number one! One conservation points worth three appeal. Okay, it's true that uh, the conservation point to appeal ratio is only two for the first 10 conservation points, but you get bonuses along the way there. So I think the one to three ratio is a really good way to think about all points in this game. This game is a race. You're trying to get to 110 points instead of something like 10 points. So that seems daunting. Uh, but unlike a lot of other heavier Euros, this is not kind of an engine building, a combo building game. It is just an efficiency game, and it is just actually a very long race. This game's got about two resources, money and cards. Lesson number two, maximize that income early. Money is going to be your primary limiter in this game. And so thinking about ways to get additional money is very important for you to break parity with your opponents. Um, the first 15 appeal or so are very important. Playing an animal before the first break is usually pretty essential in terms of getting your incomes kickstarted along the way. But even beyond that, you have options like building those kiosks. Some sponsors will give you additional money. There's a few ways to get through that. This game does go for about five or six breaks. And by the time you've finished the third break, there's not going to be enough time left in the game that the income becomes that important anymore. There's way too many cards early. But... You gotta keep seeing more until you don't want them at all. This one's lesson number three. <laughs> Pitch early. Now dig for more. Discarding cards is bad. It's one of your few resources in this game and it just, they go away. Um, you start with four cards. You might draw two more cards. You might play one sponsor, one animals. And then you really don't want to be drawing more cards, but that might kind of be what your action row is telling you to do. And that can be pretty tough. So if you can pouch or sunbathe at the beginning, that can allow you to avoid that problem. But assuming you don't have any cards that let you do that, there are a few other ways that you can address this. One is you can X out the cards action, just kind of take an X rather than actually taking it as an action. That'll kind of prolong the break period a little bit too, maybe allowing you to play some other cards along the way. You can take that university for hand size. It's not the most exciting or explosive start, but it's a fine option if you have cards that you don't want to be getting rid of and you have kind of a longer term game plan. My favorite solution, frankly, is to use snapping. Rookies don't use snapping enough in this game. Um, snapping is like, oh, it only draws one card instead of drawing up to three cards and maybe they're really cool, but the... I want to find something special in this game it can be quite a trap. If there's something good on the track, you should take it with a snap. 
You want to know what a good enough card is? These animals? They're all the same. Lesson number four! Good animals match conservation goals. Save the Earth! It's honestly impressive how well balanced the animals are in this game. If you uh, try to look at their powers and their enclosures and all that stuff, it's just, it's not going to work. There's a really incredible video that I'll link to on the other side of someone who spent a lot more time figuring out the math than I did that changed my perspective on how animals work. But the takeaway is really this. If animals have requirements, they are worth some more victory points. If those requirements are easy to get, then you should play them. Other than that, it's not that important what animals you take. Uh, in terms of like this animal is better than that animal, like a lot of other games where they have these big decks, you're trying to figure out what the good ones and the bad ones are. In this game, it's really a lot more circumstantial. So match them up with those conservation goals or match them up with whatever your sponsors are doing and you're going to be a lot better off. Extra turns are amazing. Have you even played a board game? Didn't I just say extra turns are amazing? Big boards for big points. You're playing a multiplayer game with matching continents? Posture, posture, posture. Macaque attack! The sponsor cards, on the other hand, yeah. You want some actual good cards? Lesson number five. Not all sponsors are equal. There's a lot of tier lists online from players who are better than I am, and I agree with those tier lists largely, so you can go and find them if you want to dig in. I'll just throw a few in this in this video that I think are kind of the most important for you to really be paying attention to, but the main thing to be considering with these sponsors is something that gives a persistent, dependable bonus throughout the course of the game um, is generally better than these ones that sound kind of funky or weird. Uh, for the most part. And then there are some that are powerful but require more setup and organization. Leave that for folks that have maybe played the game a few more times. If you just kind of focus on these big ones uh, and, and kind of pick them up as you grab them, you're going to be better. These bad boys early will make your game terrifying. Oh, you want an ologist? Does it match a conservation goal? Except Elizabeth Hargrave. Always play Elizabeth Hargrave. She is pretty great. Yes, okay, it's a, it's a bit of a gag, uh, but birds are generally the best creatures in this game, so of the ologists, it's the card that you could get away playing most, expecting that your opponents are going to play some. You feeling the burn yet, ladies and gents and non-binary folks? Because we're about to get into workers. Worker management is probably the thing that puts you apart from uh, low skill level to high skill level in this game. Um, it is the thing that gives you stuff for free in this game. It's the only thing that doesn't cost money or cards in order to do something better. Um, it's completely in your control in that regard. And so making sure that you're using those workers, having opportunities to take that association action to get more points than your opponent is what's going to put you ahead. I want you to maximize that association action early and often. Six! Don't you dare let that association card languish. So if everyone's worker isn't doing anything, this is not really that big of a deal. But the idea just kind of extends what we're already talking about here. You want to be using that association card as much and as efficiently as possible. So any opportunity that you can and your opponents can't which usually reflects the number of workers that you have, is going to put you a leg up on them. It's dangerous to go alone, and two heads are better than one. Lesson seven. Get that second worker, fast! Again, talking about how important the association action is, that second worker is absolutely the key thing that you have to accomplish in the game. You really should be aiming to do this after the first break, if possible. Um, if not, you're looking to do it right after the second break. If you're not, someone else is going to. Two workers means you've got that breathing room <sighs> between breaks. There's a few places you can get your workers. It's so important that I'm actually going to go through every single one of them right now, uh, roughly in order of the one that I think you're most likely to get versus the ones that you're least likely to get. The worker rewards one of the main reasons you want to do conservation early. You need the right cards in universities, but a reputation gets you there. You can always get two conservation points and then sacrifice a card flip. Have you considered the third partner zoo? Might be that full throat is in the cards. Like I said before, 
Ideally, you are getting your worker after the first break and you're probably doing that by executing a conservation project and then getting ahead either from the two CPs or for your conservation project reward. If you're not doing that, then you should be looking to get into the, the, the third cycle, so this, after the second break, as quickly as possible so that you can be getting a worker. Maybe you're getting it with a partner zoo. Maybe you just needed more time to set up a conservation action. Maybe it's uh, because of the way that you're getting reputation. But whatever it is, like you need to have a plan to get that one quickly because your opponents for sure have a plan to get that second head as soon as possible. What's that? Why do I care so much about workers? Chief, are you even listening? You've got your partner zoos. The discounts are nice enough. Like I said, money is a limiter in this game. Uh, but the real advantage of having a partner zoo is that you can then have that icon towards getting a conservation project for one of those continents. Further, you need those partner zoos so that you can do the breeding programs. Breeding program is one of the best cat cards you can have in your starting hand if you have a paired animal that goes with it. That's a really nice way to essentially guarantee that you can get an after the first break conservation project finished. We got universities. The early reputation of the universities can get you to your card flips kind of faster than anything else. Like the double university strategy is the fastest way to flip two cards, I would say, very reliably in this game. Um, hand size is, is nice and offers flexibility. Um, I do think that people overrate it just a little bit at the beginning of the game. Like it's a must take right at the beginning. It's the best thing. Um, there are more powerful things that you can do, I think. You just want to find a way to use your cards otherwise if you're not getting the hand size. Don't let me get you grabbing reputation! I'm being a little dramatic here. It's actually okay to take the reputation action, but really you're taking the reputation action because you have the upgraded association, and then you're using upgraded association and an additional worker to take the reputation action, uh, probably with something like uh, Association 5, partner zoo for three reputation for two and letting you do that kind of that two for one at the same time other than that though you're probably not going to be taking this action and if you are it's usually an indicator that you have not given yourself options to do other good association actions mostly for that sweet sweet conservation action the conservation bonuses are incredible and it's really easy to think about conservation projects like a place just to score a couple points but it's really these rewards that make it that jamming them is the most important part about the game. Um, a conservation can get you an early worker. It can get you income. All of the incomes are good. The $5, the two enclosure, the snap a card off the row. You can't go wrong really with any of them. Just kind of depends on what you need most in the moment. And the fact that they're flexible and powerful uh, means that getting as many conservation projects as possible is going to continue to give you more and more advantages over the course of the game. The one-time bonuses of the three X's or the $12 is going to allow you to have a really powerful end game as well. So just as many conservation projects as possible, whether you are getting the most points out of them or not, um, just gives you enough to keep your entire game plan rolling along the way. In fact, it's time for the biggest and most important lesson the cornerstone of the Yuka training program. Lesson number eight. It's as easy as your ABCs. Always be conserving. I did allude to this earlier, but the fastest way to complete a conservation project at the beginning of the game is to focus on those continental projects. By just grabbing a partner zoo and pairing it with one animal, the appropriate continent, you have the two that you need for the two CP bonus. Um, if you're the first person who grabs that partner zoo, it makes it really hard for an opponent to get on that continent zoo unless they have a lucky sponsor's draw or just kind of a lucky animal's draw or something like that. So you're in good shape to go there. Similarly, that partner zoo and a paired breeding program with the right animal, that requires a good starting hand and something that works with that. But if you can make that work, is incredible. Uh, we also should talk about the release projects. The release projects are great, and certain animals uh, are better with them than others. I won't get too much into that. That's a little bit more complex, I think. But the important thing to recognize about release projects, the mistake that I sometimes see people falling into, is they will focus on building and then releasing an animal, which is great because they have this project, they got a lot of CP for it, they maybe get some bonuses for moving up that green track. But then all of a sudden they have this problem of not having enough income because they dropped a bunch of their appeal and maybe didn't have a plan to replenish it. So be wary of that. Lesson 8 is the core of the Yuka training program because not only are you getting those points, but your opponents aren't going to be able to. Are you saturated yet? Because we're not quite done. 
Let's flip some cards. Lesson nine. Flip a card after the first break. There are a lot of ways to flip a card uh, on the, like after the first break. So you don't really have an excuse to not do it. If you do a conservation project, you get the two CP that you need to flip a card or take a worker, but probably you're going to flip a card and take a worker a different kind of way. Um, if you get two partner zoos, you flip a card. If you get two universities, you flip a card. In fact, you're set up to really even flip another card very shortly after that, uh, depending on which universities you took. So there is not really a good reason to not plan to flip a card after the first break. Doing something like one partner zoo and one university is almost always a mistake. Now we're rolling, baby! Woo! Ten. Building and animals go first. This is more like a rule of thumb, and if you find my other videos on this channel, you'll see that uh, my opinion on flipping cards has kind of changed over time a bit. But in general, build and animal are the two most powerful or diverse, I guess, um, flips, and doing them at the beginning, you, you really can't go wrong. Uh, with build, it just allows you to dump extra kiosks and pavilions in play, increasing your pavi your uh, your appeal and your income, which we've already discussed how important that is. Gives you flexibility on playing many small animals instead of just being stuck playing big animals. But if you already have a plan for big animals, then you shouldn't just jam build because it's good. So you might instead think about doing animals. And there are other instances where you would choose to do animals first as well. And it really comes down to how valuable is getting that additional reputation. It's one of the few of the flips that gives you something that you absolutely couldn't get on the other side. So being able to get access to additional reputation over the course of the game is very nice. And animals actually has a lot of other incidental bonuses. It lets you play the most powerful animals in the game. It lets you play animals off the track, which essentially asks you to convert money into cards, which is a completely reasonable exchange. Um, and then finally, it does allow you to play two animals at a lower ratio. In the beginning of the game, you don't really care about that because you run out of money. But by the end of the game, you might be wanting to play the animals action quite a lot so you can spend all of your money. So having that flexibility is very nice. Sponsors is spicy! Woo! There's only two cards you're looking for. I'd argue in a lot of ways that Sponsors is the most fun flip. It gives you kind of a lot of stuff, a lot of pluses, a lot of bonuses. Uh, on paper, I think it's actually like one of the most powerful of the flips. The thing is that it's not necessary to operate a lot of game plans. And so until you're much better at this game, I would recommend not flipping sponsors early unless you draw one of two cards, Explorers and the one that give you an association worker. These two are just the communication guy. They're just, they're so important. Um, they're just very, very powerful cards. If you have them early, an early sponsors flip is completely reasonable to play those cards. Uh, and other than that, I think that you can avoid it for a while until you feel a lot more comfortable in what cards should be flipped and when you should flip them. Association pushes you across that finish line. Association is a little funny because it kind of is a first come first serve, maybe a first two first serve kind of reward. Getting that donation for two or five dollars, even seven dollars is pretty nice. That's a great ratio. But when you're paying 10 or 12 dollars for those CP returns, it's actually probably not worth it. And I think a mistake that players often make is they just pay for that bonus without realizing that it actually jams them up from playing more powerful animals uh, in a given kind of cycle of the game. So that's something that I would definitely be wary of. Having the ability to take two association actions is helpful especially if you're gonna do something like partner zoo and the reputation action like we mentioned before. Um, but for me, usually an association is a later flip. Uh, it's nice to be the first person to flip association. So I often find that it's the person who is ahead uh, kind of in tempo and scoring is the person who ends up flipping association first and it kind of keeps them a little bit further ahead. So if you don't have a need to flip your other cards, you can choose to maybe delay this one. Uh, I think that the real question is, does association become the third or the fourth flip? Have you got what it takes to get my level of reputation? So cards used to be kind of my number one flip, and I don't necessarily mean that that was something that I flipped first, but it was something that always would get flipped every game. 
And that's because it allows you to get to the top of the reputation track where there's lots of sweet rewards um, on top of the fact that just drawing cards gives you more options, gives you more power, has you more opportunity to draw into the animals that you need to match the conservation projects or um, to, to draw into the really powerful cards in the stack. And so I liked being able to draw cards from the, the row as well as into the deck. The more I started playing things with like animals and buying animals off the row, it meant that I didn't need to draw cards off the row quite as much. And the more everybody got better at the game, meaning that it ended faster, the less often I saw that I was going all the way up in reputation to the maximum. So uh, I think at a, I think for quite a while, like cards was an, was an auto flip for me. And now it's become something where every few games, I'd say like one out of every, I don't know, six or seven games, I actually don't end up flipping cards at all, uh, depending on what my game plan is, which I would not have said maybe like a year ago or something like that. Um, generally, my, my default flip order is going to be build, animals, cards, and association, probably in that order. It does depend on what map you're playing and so on and so forth. But for the most part, that's my default rule of thumb. And if you have a good reason to flip something else in a different order, that's great. They're all good. All the, all the flips will help you. They just, none of them are central towards winning the game. You follow these 10 listens every single day, and you will be cruising your way to victory in no time. Mark Nova is a deep game, and it can be played at a lot of different layers of strategy, which is why this game gets played by so many people um, all the time. It's also important to understand that this game is pretty high variance. And so, you know, the reason that the folks who are really good keep winning even in a high variance game is because they understand how to evaluate the board state. They know when to play risky versus playing conservative and things like that. There's a lot of decision points in this game for those players to get ahead. But even if you're playing against somebody who's an expert in this game, if you use the 10 tips that I've outlined in this video and you are on the luckier side, you're probably going to come out on top. Um, sometimes the chips just kind of fall that way. And that is, I think, the most that you can ask at trying to play this game at like a starting strategic level. As you start to get better and better at it, then you have to ask yourself the question of, okay, I don't have the best starting hand or I don't have, you know, I'm not drawing into the cards that I need. So what is it that I can do to attack this from a different side? And that's something that we're uh, going to have to consider more at the expert level. That being said, I hope you took something away from this video. Really appreciate you watching. If you haven't already, please throw a like and subscribe this way. And have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. If you're not convinced yet, watch these testimonials. My name is Jonathan, and thanks to the Phoenix and Yuka training programs, I've increased my average appeal by 8.7 a game.